Call the meeting to order. It's a meeting of August 17th. Note that uh, all commissioners are present. <coughs> First item of business is the order of business. Are there any uh, changes to the order of business? Mr. Kessel, is there a change to the order of business? Excuse me, President Johnson. Yes, under the timetable agenda, <coughs> number three, um, Dr. Richard McCallum uh, is, can no longer be present for the 6 p.m. timetable agenda. So we'll scratch that. Thank you. Okay. Is there any other changes? The President, I'll move the agenda be approved as amended. Second. We have the motion, the second. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, say nay. The motion carries. Second item uh, for your consideration is the consent agenda. Are there any items on the consent agenda you wish to discuss? Hearing none, would there be a motion to approve the consent agenda? So moved. Second. We have the motion, the second. Any discussion? Not, we'll vote. Mr. Steiner? Aye. Mrs. Stuckart? Aye. Mr. Jackson? Aye. Mr. Frenzel? Aye. Chair votes aye. Motion carries. We'll move to the uh, non-timetable agenda, and that's under tab four, and the uh, first item there are, are, is the 2009 Southwest Regional Grant Applications. Um, and who's reporting on behalf of the committee here? I certainly may do that. Uh, <laughs> President Johnson, commissioners, the, the commission, um, or committee, excuse me, is made up of uh, Commissioner Steiner, Commissioner uh, Jackson, myself, uh, we went through all of the requests. The request totaled uh, $111,000. Um, our budget doesn't allow us to satisfy all those requests. Uh, so there was a, um, some thresholds that we had to establish and meet in order to divvy out the dollars. What you uh, see before you uh, is the recommendations that are being made. Uh, I can walk through those. They total $23,500. Um, the City of Beach made a request to expand their golf course and improve their greens. The request was for 5000 Our recommendation is for two. The City of Belfield uh, is, would like to replace the roof on the Memorial Hall. Uh, their request was for 15000 Our uh, recommendation is for 2500 The Belfield Park and Rec also made a request for a playground and skating rink. Uh, to a little over 8,000, and the recommendation is 1,000. Dunn County Fair Associations, uh, their cultural center uh, improvements, um, their request was 5,000, and our recommendation is to grant that full request. Uh, the Gladstone Park Board made a request for picnic tables to the tune of 1,400. We're recommending no award. City of Golva wanted to buy uh, chairs for their community center. Uh, the request is a thousand. We're recommending full award. The um, Adams County Development Corp uh, Tees and Glass Art Project. Uh, they requested three thousand. We're recommending no award. The Hedinger Park Board would like to um, make improvements to a water slide to the tune of eight thousand. We recommend a thousand. Dakota Dakota Prairie Helping Hands uh, made a request for five hundred, and we recommend granting that request. Um, these are all, that was also in Hedinger, and the last Hedinger request was for um, the Main Street Hanging Flower Basket Project for $1,000. Uh, we recommend $750. Kildeer made several requests. The Park District made three, uh, just in terms of uh, making this go a little bit quicker. Uh, they, their total requests were about $13,000, and we're recommending about, uh, two. The Kildeer Saddle Club made two requests. Uh, for 26500 we're recommending um, no award of funds. The Manning Community Center um, uh, did not make a financial request, although they, did, um, they, they didn't delineate their financial request, uh, and we did not recommend a, a, uh, an award. The Mott uh, community has uh, about four different projects, totaling ab uh, just under $10,000. And our recommendation is to award uh, 2000 to those. New England um, has one project for seating and a shaded area. Uh, again, 
no specific dollar amount requested and we, we recommend a $250 award. Um, New Radic, they have a handicap project uh, or, or to make a project handicap accessible for 3500 we recommend 1000 Richardson Park Board, uh, to replace broken pipes and decking, uh, the request was for 1500 we recommended zero. Um, South Heart, uh, again, a request with no financial um, amount stated, uh, so we recommended $1,000 to build a storage shed. And then uh, Taylor, there was three different requests from Taylor. Those requests for, were for $7,000 in total, and we recommend uh, 3500 so again, the total award recommendation is 23,500 out of 111 recommend, uh, made. Thank you, Mr. Kessel. Uh, do uh, any commissioners have any comments or questions regarding these recommendations? If not, would there be a, a motion uh, regarding whether to accept or reject these? Moves the approval. Second. We have the motion and the second. Any discussion? Hearing none, then uh, we'll vote. Uh, Mr. Frenzel? Aye. Mr. Stuckart? Aye. Mr. Jackson? Aye. Mr. Steiner? Aye. Chair votes aye. Motion carries. Uh, we'll go to item B under tab <coughs> four, and that's uh, consideration to approve a information technologies joint powers agreement with Dickinson Parks and Recreation. And uh, Mr. Colleen or Mr. Kessel or either one of you introducing this item further? President Johnson and Commissioners, the, um, the City of Dickinson brought a, uh, our technology department in-house uh, recently. And when we did that, um, there was 75% of the, of the individual's time was spent on city issues. Uh, so we knew that there would be some uh, time that could be spent elsewhere. So I did approach the park board. Uh, they uh, had been receiving services uh, from various providers uh, throughout the years and uh, brought them this IT joint powers agreement so they could have one consistent provider uh, and that be the, the city of Dickinson's IT staff. Um, we negotiated the contract that you see before you uh, and believe that it's in the best interest of uh, both parties. Uh, to enter into it. It does uh, call for an invoice of services, um, so we will be billing the park board whenever uh, our IT professional, Mr. Falsing, um, reports it to a call. Much like uh, a, any private business or contractor would. So. Thank you, Mr. Kessel. Um, any comments or questions regarding the agreement? I'll move we approve the agreement. Second. We have the motion, the second. Any discussion? No discussion. We'll vote. Mr. Jackson? Aye. Mr. Frenzel? Aye. Mr. Steiner? Aye. Mrs. Dukert? Aye. Chair votes aye. Motion carries. We'll go to tab five, public safety, and uh, begin with the fire department, Chief Sevak. <coughs> Mayor Johnson, commissioners, as you'll see in the report, we recorded 28 incidents during the month of July. 15 of those were related to the storm on July, the evening of July 8th and extending into the days that followed. Numbers would have been higher, but several of the incidents, unfortunately, were lost into the general heading of the storm or the tornado. Several of the individual incidents that we would have recorded otherwise just got messed up in the jumble. No other way to say it but uh, they were addressed, they were responded to, that I can assure you. Through our partnership with Dickinson Rural Fire Department that evening, we were able to put 60 firefighters in the street on the ground shortly after the storm. They had approximately 12 pieces of equipment, 12 apparatus at various times that were out and about, and, uh, sometimes more than that. Sometimes that even included personal vehicles that the, the firefighters would be using, depending on what they needed to get around. Uh, Bismarck Fire Chief, the Mandan Fire Chief, both offered assistance if we would have needed it. And closer to home, the Gladstone Fire Department also offered assistance. They were ready to come with a truck and a crew if we would have needed it. Uh, on the evening of July 21st, the officers of the Dickinson Rural Fire Department and the Dickinson City Fire Department got together to evaluate our response to the incident. 
critique our actions. And we did uh, come up with some areas that we need to address, some things that we could do better, some items and equipment that we need to standardize. And we'll be working on that as we go into the future here. And I know you've heard this before, and I've heard you say this before. But just again, the cooperation between all responding agencies and departments, the commitment to duty by all employees and volunteers alike that evening was tremendous. Also, you'll notice on July 16th, we have four incidents to detector activations. Uh, these are all to the same location, and it was a malfunctioning smoke detector. Just so you know, however, when you see something like that in the report, we didn't send out a response, an alert crew response, four different times. Once we knew from the initial response what we were dealing with, we worked with that property owner uh, either on the phone or by sending an individual to help them until they were able to alleviate the problem that day. So that doesn't reflect four full department responses when you see that. And by our working with them, they were able to address and correct their problem. And that's all I've got. There's just one more quick remark. In talking about the number of people, the number of firefighters we were able to put out in the street the night of the storm, um, again, I know you know this, but I just want to say it again. Other than four individuals, those are volunteer firefighters. Our last crew was released the next morning at 3 a.m. Thank you. That's all I've got, unless you have questions. Thank you, Chief. Any questions, comments? I'd just like to comment on, on how well your group went door to door right away and relieved the homeowners as well as we relatives and friends on the other part of the city that couldn't get to them. Thank you very much. Thank you. Chief Rummel. Good evening, Mr. President. Commissioners, in closing your packet this evening is um, a really short uh, summary or traffic services report. Um, there were 47 accidents, if I could just highlight a couple of things, and reported in July. Uh, eight of the 47 were hit and runs, and there were eight reported injury-related accidents. Um, as you can see towards the bottom paragraph there, in 2009, the Dickinson Police Department has averaged 77.1 crash investigations per month, and these reflect the weather <coughs> conditions, of course, um, from February and March. Two other items I do have that aren't on, on this report is um, last week um, we had a team represent the Dickinson Police Department at the North Dakota Peace Officers Association, the annual shoot, and I do have some results of that. Um, there was a, the team consisted of Officer Kylan Clauser, Jeremy Mosier, Sergeant <coughs> Dusty Dossinger, and Sergeant Dan Brown. On this competition, the four-person team took third in the master class. The two-person team, which would have consisted of Kylan Clauser and Dan Brown, took first in the master class. Individuals, uh, Kylan Clauser took fourth in an unclassified class, and Sergeant Brown took first in expert and second in off-duty, and fourth in Governor's 20. Governor's 20 is an elite uh, group that, that do several shoots throughout the year, and then they tally up a total score. And Sergeant Brown has been on the Governor's 20 now consecutively in the, uh, for the probably the last five years and within the top five all of those years. I also was able to attend on Friday the uh, graduation class of uh, the Northwest University Traffic Institute uh, pol Police Staff and Command School. Uh, this is a 10-week rigorous course that is um, that the students take part in and it, it, it entails management and supervision. Sergeant Siani and Sergeant Dave Wilkie attended and did graduate from that class and we're glad to have them back on. Um, we couldn't have them any sooner. So um, they've been gone for 10 weeks during the summer. They have graduated and this is an ongoing process we have for succession training. Um, all the sergeants on up have attended this class within our department. It's, it's pretty uh, strenuous and I'm just glad to say that they made it through and Usually when they're done, they don't want to repeat that one. So with that, I would take any comments and or questions. Any questions for the chief? Chief Rummel, do we, uh, as a community, do we see a little bump in the accident rate as school starts? Is that something for us to be aware of as a community? Yes, that's a, that's a good point. Yes, as school starts, we try and make an awareness um, program come out of that. Uh, 
we have officers at each of the schools, usually on opening day, to try and keep the um, traffic down uh, and hopefully um, keep the traffic ac accidents at a minimum. But we do see the, the rush and the bustle and then everybody's got their mind on getting the kids to school and stuff. So we do see a little bump that yeah. particularly that week. So I would like to um, make that awareness and I appreciate you bringing that up and ask that everybody just drive a little bit more careful now that school's out. So, or coming back in I should say. Thank you. Okay. Anything else? Okay. Thank All you, right. Chief Romo. Thank you. It's uh, 5.30. We have a 5.30 uh, agenda item, and that's to hear from Jackie Miller uh, regarding the uh, tornado. So, Ms. Miller, welcome. Thank you. President Johnson and commissioners, and especially Mr. Kessel, who um, invited me to come um, as a result of the letter that I had written and originally addressed to Jan Zent. Um, I certainly appreciate the opportunity to explain to you why I think it can work and why I think it's important. In order to do that, I think I have to go through a little bit of our current system, so if you'll bear with me, I know you're all aware of the tax system, but I just would like to take it step by step if I may. Dickinson, as you know, has experienced over the last several years a gradual increase in property tax revenues, basically due to two things. An increase in the assessed values of the properties and also the new construction. Taxes are figured in Dickinson by taking that assessed value times 0.5, which gives you the full and true value, a misnomer, I think, by the way, but that's how we do it times 0.09 for residential, times 0.10 for commercial to get the taxable value, and then that is taken times the mill levy, which is currently 424.75. There's only two variables in that equation, the assessed values and the mill levy. The assessed values, of course, are determined by the city. The mill levy is influenced by six different entities, all of whom receive a portion of the funds that are generated. This North Dakota, of course, as you all know, is a fractional assessment state, which means that the city budgets dollars and not mills. So what the city does, as you know, and you started last Friday, is take a look at your budget, take a look at the income side of it, decide how many dollars you need to generate from property taxes, take a look then at the total value of the assessed property, and decide how many mills you have to apply to that assessed value in order to generate the money. The county does the same thing as does the park board. Now the city receives approximately between 22 and 23 percent of the money that's generated, so the city is therefore responsible for between 22 and 23 percent of the mills. Once those are determined by the city, they go into, for lack of a better word, we'll call it a mill pot. The county does the same thing. They receive another 22 to 23 percent. They're about the same as the city. Their mills go into the mill pot. The park district gets about 7 percent, as you know, more mills into the mill pot. Two other entities, the Water Authority and the state of North Dakota, account for less than 1 percent. But we'll throw their mills into the pot as well. If you've been doing the math with me, you know that we're missing around 47 to 48 percent of the mills in our mill pot, which is where the school district comes in. Now the school district, as you know, is treated differently than the city in that the school district is allowed to mill, to, excuse me, levy mills directly, which are capped by the state. A system that protects the tax pay payers, particularly in the small, smaller districts, the smaller communities, but which also leaves those communities a little bit short when it comes time to fulfilling their budgetary needs. So this year the legislation said let's level that playing field a little bit for all of the small districts in the state. And they said we're going to give, the state will give the school districts more money. So now the school district will not have to levy as many mills because and making them less dependent on local property taxes. So now we can take some of those mills back out of the mill pot. And of course, property owners in Dickinson are smiling. Fewer mills means lower taxes. 
Then you factor in the other thing that I talked about at the beginning besides the assessed value, which is the new construction. New construction, of course, adds to the assessed values. So the more assessed value you have, again, to get to that same number of dollars, the fewer mills you need. Now, we don't see the immediate impact of new construction. It takes roughly two years, sometimes a little longer, depending on when the tax exemption application <coughs> is filed. But basically, in Dickinson, of course, the new construction enjoys a two-year partial, if not complete, hiatus as far as property taxes go. So when those come back onto the rolls, of course, you increase the assessed values and now the city of Dickinson, in order to get to that budgeted amount, doesn't have to levy any more mills to get additional funding and be still my heart, may even be able to drop the mills, which has happened over the past several years. Things were looking extremely good for taxpayers and property owners in the city of Dickinson. <coughs> and then along came, of course, as you all know, July 8th. And all of a sudden, things weren't looking so good for an awful lot of property owners in the city of Dickinson. And conversely, of course, for the city itself. Because as the city takes a look at the damages that were done as a result of the tornado and abates all or a portion of the assessed values of the properties that were affected, the city now has fewer dollars that are attributed to the assessed values. How much less? I know that the abatements have not been calculated yet, but for the, the sake of an example, the original media reports were $20 million in damages. Now, I don't know whether that $20 million was just property damages or whether it included the cost to the city to restore electricity, to restore gas services, to reopen the inert landfill south of town, to haul the tons and tons of debris out there. But for the sake of argument, because I want to be as conservative as I can with my numbers, I'm going to say that all 20 million of that, for my example, was in fact property damage. I'm also going to assume that all 20 million of it will qualify for the abatements. I don't know whether it will or not. I know that there's, there are certain rules and regulations that the city is dealing with now as far as which, which properties will be allowed abatements. Again, I, don't, I certainly am not foolish enough to stand in front of you wearing a big old pair of rose-colored glasses, so we're going to be as conservative as we can. Assuming that whole $20 million abated this year, and applying the tax formula that I talked about earlier, that would translate to about $382,000 in tax revenues that the city would not be getting in a year. Now, the storm occurred a little over halfway through the year, so we can cut that back to about $190,000. I think that's a realistic figure for the city to be looking at as far as abatements for 2009. Now, my suggestion is that the abatements for the property owners who did not suffer complete losses be extended for another two years, the same as they are for the people who are rebuilding. So to look at the impact that that will have on the city of Dickinson, we have to go back to the $20 million, the $382,000 extended next year. But out of that $20 million, we have to take out the properties that were completely destroyed because those that were completely destroyed, the vehicle already exists within the city ordinances to give them the tax exemption. So we, we have to pull that out. Now I know initially num the number that I heard was 40 um, homes that were completely destroyed. I know that has been downgraded. Um, so again, to be conservative, 30 homes completely destroyed. An average price of $100,000 per home gives us about three million dollars. That comes off that 20 that's already taken care of. Since I'm here to advocate basically for the residential property owners, we also have to take out the commercial damage that was done. And I think, again, being conservative, that we can take out about a third of that. And like I said, I, I, I think it's going to be closer to half, but to be conservative. If we take a third of that off that 382,000, you're left at about $220,000.
that's what I think the worst case scenario is for the city of Dickinson for each of the next two years in order to extend that abatement to the property owners who um, suffered damages, like I said, not complete, but suffered, to give them a little bit of a break while they're rebuilding their homes. And of course, the uh, new construction that I talked about earlier will be increased because you're going to see an increase in permits, permit requests this year. And in two years, all of that will be coming back onto the tax rolls in full force. Um, that's basically the economic side of it, why I think it can, can work for the city of Dickinson. Why I think it's important, the human side of it, is that the people that I'm talking about here are the people who are still dealing with and negotiating with insurance companies, with lenders, with contractors, spending countless, of hour, countless hours in our retail stores to find the values of the, pro of the property that they lost and also replacing it. They're the people who were up on their roofs at daybreak the morning after the storm with plywood and plastic trying to save what was left of their homes. They're the people who are down there now on their hands and knees pulling up carpeting, cleaning up glass, cleaning up insulation and sheetrock to keep this process, this rebuilding process moving forward because they can't wait for the contractors. They're the people who have cleaned up their yards so well that they're down there watering and mowing them even though they can't live in their homes because they are their homes and they plan to be back there. These are the people that I think deserve our admiration, our thanks, and our help. And that's why I came here this afternoon. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Miller. Uh, any comments or questions by uh, commissioners or staff? I have a question, Mr. Mayor. Um, <coughs> what I followed you 100% since I'm a realtor. I know exactly what you're talking about. The abatement we have now is only the first $75,000 on any new property. So they save about approximately in the past has been about $1,500. Is that what you're looking at? Or are you, and I'm not sure if this is even legal um, because we do have a city ordinance or whatever, and I'm sure Matt will explain it to us. But is that what you're looking at, Jackie? What I'm talking about, um, Commissioner Ducart, is basically whatever amount is abated. Like the city, I'm assuming, will take a look at a property. Let's say we have a, a $100,000 property, like the average one, and it sustained $25,000 in damages. So for 2009, my understanding is the city will abate that $25,000 because the property is only worth $75,000 or abate it for half the year, roughly half the year. What I'm saying is once that abatement is determined that it be extended for two years. And the beauty of it is that it won't require any additional manpower hours on part of the city because those abatements will already have been determined. All I'm asking is that the commission and I realize it'll take an ordinance, take that, those abatements, and instead of cutting them off at the end of 2009, extend them for another two years while these people rebuild their homes, rebuild their lives, and rebuild our community. And then in those, the end of those two years, we're hoping, like your Betsy, that your house is gonna be worth more money, so we'll be, heaven forbid, more taxes. <laughs> <coughs> It's a necessary evil, and, and, and that's what I believe will happen. For example, right now, if there's, there is one of these $100,000 houses out there, um, in fact, I know of one, of a friend of ours, the city had it assessed at 117 three. To rebuild that house will cost $142,000. So once that house comes back onto the tax rolls in two years, it'll be valued at 142 for tax purposes as opposed to the 117.3. So you've got an automatic built in there. Just, just <laughs> works. Just Commissioner Schneider. Um, with, with the current two year, uh, uh, for the first 75,000 on a new home, uh, you, did, you did touch on this here and, and, and uh, that is, Part of what seems to catch people really off guard is 
they, they know they're getting their first 75,000 deferred for the two years, but then they're also not getting any tax adjustment that we have made during those two years. So they're going to be, the catch up is going to be those two years plus any adjustment that we made within those two years. Are, are you following me? So I do. I understand that, and, that and throughout uh, the course, if I if just very simply and correct me if I'm if I'm wrong Commissioner Steiner but when a, a house first starts out at new construction mm -hmm. basically you have the lot value and that's what the owner pays taxes on then they start constructing a home and through the construction process the city goes in and assesses a certain percentage um, I know that the, the the highest I think I've ever seen is 60 percent prior to the property coming back onto the tax rolls at full assessed value. Mm -hmm. So it will go up to like 60% of what, and, and actually what the city uses, in my understanding, again, correct me if I'm wrong, is the building permit that was, um, the building permit application is the amount that they use mm -hmm. for the full assessed value when it comes back back into. So it's, it's a gradual process. Again, I know that, that back in, and I have to cheat here because I didn't memorize the numbers. But in 2006, the city issued 32.3 well, $32 million dollars in new building permits. Mm -hmm. 2006 construction, depending on the time of the year, are some of the properties that will be coming back into the tax rolls this year. Then in 2007, and again, these properties will be coming in next year, um, about 27.2. We had a little bit of a, a, a lull in our our healthy new construction market. But then in 2008, $39.5 million in new construction. Now, like I said, I'm not telling you that you're going from zero to 32.5 or $39.5 million. There are some gradual increases in there. But I know that, um, in fact, in reading the media reports from last Friday's budget meeting, that the city was comfortable enough um, Mr. Kessel, I believe you were quoted in there. Uh, the city was comfortable enough with the new construction that was coming onto the market full force and the full impact of that to not have to find other revenue sources. That was enough to offset the increases because I know there's increases on the expense side. Just as we've seen the increases on the income side, there have, as I understand, you know, I understand there's been increases on the expense side as well. and. You know, there's been enough coming in to keep the city healthy and to give those increases without having to increase assessed values in the other properties. Did I answer your question? Yes, you did a very nice job explaining the whole, whole thing, too. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> I think it cleared things up for a lot of people. But uh, uh, I'm on board with this here, and, I'm, you know, I'm just wondering how we can do it. Just for the public's knowledge, Jackie teaches a class in real estate at the university, so that's why she knows all of the amounts too. So, kudos to you. Um, you did a you did as good a job explaining how uh, property taxes are calculated as as I've heard. Um, Thank you. Just uh, about the, our budget meeting, um, we said that uh, we really didn't want to increase property taxes. We didn't say we wouldn't look at other sources of revenue. As a matter of fact, we in that meeting we did talk about different possibilities of raising additional revenue. Um, the, the very initial run of the budget, per se, really showed us with a deficit. And, and uh, I think the desire of the city staff and the city commission there was that we whittle that deficit down, not by increasing property taxes, but by finding expenses we could cut further. And if there were uh, other revenue sources besides property taxes, we would look at those and consider those too. So I mean, I, I wouldn't, since we're being taped and this goes out to everybody, I wouldn't want people to have uh, the impression that we took other revenue sources off the table for this budget session because we haven't. But no, and, and as a property yeah. owner, I thank you. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I, I think uh, uh, your suggestion is a very noble suggestion and, and this, 
especially for the people who have suffered damage from the, the tornado. Um, question I have is would you envision this uh, if, if we came up with something that, that uh, this something would apply to victims of other disasters? For example, if someone's home was struck by lightning and burned to the ground, would, would this apply to that? Or rather than a tornado, if it was those straight line winds that uh, took the roof off a of home, would this program apply to that and so on and so forth? Um, or do I, you I, see this as a one-time event? I'm, I'm coming to you today basically as, as a one-time event, President Johnson. Um, but I guess in the future, if properties are abated, you know, and again, it has to go through that process by the city because of uh, damages done by acts of nature, I guess, for lack of a better word, um, it certainly would be something, you know, and, and, and there again, I, I don't know what kind of money you're dealing with. Um, I don't know how feasible it is to look at every, every possible damage, flooding, like you said, straight line winds, lightning, um, any of those types of things. But I guess I could see property owners in the future coming to you saying, we did it back in 19, or 2009, I want my my abatement now as well. No. I, I think, um, and, and Mr. Colin, you correct me if I'm wrong, but any time a property suffers severe damage, for whatever reason, the property owner can, can come to us for an abatement on that until the property is restored to its original uh, form. That's correct, uh, President Johnson. Any time there's damage to a property or a property suffers some sort of decrease in value, uh, the property owner can come before the city and ask for an abatement of the property tax. I think the difference here is that probably under current lo state law and, and current city ordinances, once the property is returned to, uh, they're done fixing it and it's returned, I guess, to the form that it's going to be in, then, then it, it also goes back on the tax rolls at, okay. at that uh, appropriate value. And you're just saying, look, uh, for example, in the case of the tornado, it might be let's add an extra 18 months or so to, to that process. Correct. And um, I don't know if that's even legal for us to consider, if we'd be violating any state laws or not. Well, I, I know we're mandated by state law every year to uh, certify that the property values as assessed are within a certain tolerance of their full and true value. And that is why typically when somebody comes in for an abatement, it, it is for a one-year period. Uh, it's just for the tax year under consideration that the abatement is applied for. I'm not aware of a vehicle under state law that would allow us to extend past the current tax year, the current assessment year, uh, to extend an abatement out past uh, the year under consideration. Um, there may be something available under state law, but I'm not aware of it. The uh, remodel credit that uh, that we give, or exemption, I shouldn't say credit, uh, when someone's home is damaged uh, or other property, would that qualify as a remodel when they're? Uh, the remodel exemption falls under a different scenario than the abatement uh, procedure. And for exemptions, there is a specific criteria in state law that a property has to meet uh, in order to get a two-year exemption or some other sort of exemption. That would be something different than the abatement process that we have to consider as a Board of Equalization every year. So you'd like to research that a little bit, probably, before yeah. you'd really say, okay. Other questions? I guess I had the same question. It seemed that the abatement process would not be a possibility in law, but I wondered about the exemption process because I think that there is state law uh, restriction even to the exemption process. Is there not? Is that what you just said? Right. There, is, there are restrictions <coughs> as to which property owners will qualify for exemptions on new construction or remodel exemptions. Um, and those are creatures of state law, and we'd be at, at the mercy of the state legislature as to who would apply for those exemptions. Well, I, I don't think it would hurt to do a little research um, 
um, Mr. Colleen and just come back to us and tell us kind of what's along these lines, what is mm -hmm. possible and what is not possible uh, given the state statutes here and then let us mull it over from that. Mm -hmm. I can do that. You know, I, I know at our last meeting, uh, uh, Mrs. Zemp reported on the abatement process um, and uh, we tried to publicize it at that meeting and this meeting is another opportunity to publicize that process that uh, if your property was damaged in the tornado, certainly contact the assessor's office. They're more than willing to help you fill out the proper paperwork so you, uh, at the very least you get the abatements that you're entitled to, you know, under current law and current city ordinances. So we certainly want to encourage people to do that. Um, if I remember right, I think she reported that there were 23 structures that we would say were totally demolished and as you said earlier there were fewer than what what we thought which was good news and um, the 20 million dollar estimate was was my estimate and I can't even say it was on the back of an envelope it was probably on the back of my palm of my hand here when, when we did that but I know we were thinking that that was all damage to the city and not just damage to structures I mean there were several vehicles for example that were damaged and um, so forth. I, I can, if memory serves me correctly, with the new construction that we've had in our city for the last seven, eight years, when you consider all the exemptions that come off and the new property that comes on, generally to the city it, it means somewhere between seventy and a hundred thousand dollars a year in new revenue to the city. So when we talk about $30 million of construction or new values coming on, that sounds like a lot, but by the time you work it through those formulas, uh, you, uh, you so aptly reported on earlier, by the time that actually gets the dollars to the city, it's, uh, it's relative to our entire budget. It's not a large amount. And, and I understand yeah, yeah. that. And, and even doing the conservative side of that, President Johnson, with the 70000 off the 220 that I suggested it, it would cost, we're down to 150. So, yeah. you know, I, there, there are some offsetting mm -hmm. factors. And, and when I figured the 382 and down, I was using the 424.75 mils, which we all hope will be lower by this fall. Well, it should be. It Espec should. <laughs> especially with the uh, legislation passed for the school districts. So. Yeah. If not, can I come back here again? I'm just kidding. Uh, absolutely. <laughs> We would expect you to. So, other comments, questions? Thank okay, you. Okay, well, again, again, thank you for allowing me the time. I took a little bit more than my 15 minutes, but since the six o'clock canceled, we'll just figure. We figure we gave out. you we gave you DSU's time, um, but I do think it would be good to you know do do the research so Matt would be uh, have a clear understanding of what we can do and can't do and report back to us. President Johnson, commissioners, uh, there's also Assessor Zent is putting together some comparisons. Uh, there are other things that the um, legislature changed this year. For instance, the $75,000 exemption couldn't be as high as $150,000 uh, for two years. So she is putting to be together some information related to that. It might not be a bad idea to look at these in, in, uh, together. Maybe you can, yeah, work that out to where it's a joint report. Okay. Well, it's uh, 6 o'clock. We have a 545 uh, timetable agenda item. And uh, Mr. Rapp, are you going to introduce uh, this since it's Altig Engineering? Thank you, Mr. President. Tonight uh, we requested uh, Altig Engineering to update the commission where we currently are in our wastewater treatment uh, plant facility uh, assessment. Um, tonight from Altig Engineering is Mike Berg and Carl Olson. They're both uh, environmental engineers with Altig and I would turn it over to those two. And we have a PowerPoint presentation. Um, don't pull it So up. you want me to move? Yeah. <laughs> Good evening. Mike Berg with Altig Engineers. 
and this is Car Carla Olson. Uh, we were hired by the city in March to develop a master plan for the wastewater treatment facility. Uh, we're here this evening to provide you an update on the status of this project. We're going to do an overview of the existing conditions, the facility performance. We'll get into the design and performance analysis, future conditions, Heart River discharge limitations, and process equipment evaluation. We'll also talk about the final stage, which is technical memo number four. Okay, uh, brief introduction, and we're just going to give kind of a high-level uh, summary of what we've been doing, but if you have any questions at any time, wanting more specifics, feel free to speak up and ask me to go into more detail. Uh, the overall wastewater treatment facility uh, includes preliminary treatment building, uh, aeration ponds, uh, four stabilization ponds, uh, irrigation, and discharge for effluent disposal. Uh, when we were setting up the master plan uh, overall process, we looked at uh, doing it in technical memorandum uh, format. Uh, we looked at Tech Memo 1 uh, for existing conditions and facility performance, uh, Tech Memo 2, uh, future conditions, Tech Memo 3, uh, an equipment evaluation. And that's basically the step we're at now. We've been through uh, Tech Memos 1, 2, and 3, and then we'll move on to Tech Memo 4 the alternative analysis. Uh, existing conditions, the first thing we looked at was flow. We want to see what's coming in the front door of the plant and compare it to how it was designed. Uh, the average uh, is the red line uh, across that and the design is the yellow line. Um, just uh, as a side note, the actual uh, capacity according to current design standards is lower uh, probably in the 2.3 or so MGD range. Um, so you can see uh, our trend line, the blue trend line, is increasing, but we are still uh, below the original facility design. Uh, the next thing is the influent loading conditions, basically the strength of the wastewater coming in. Uh, again, uh, we're here as a concentration, the red line, and the blue line is the existing conditions. So we are above uh, the design for concentration. However, the other component for loading is the flow. So when you combine those two together, uh, we're not over the loading, but we're right at it, which I'll show you in the next slide. Um, here's an overview of every parameter we looked at compared to the original design. The first one I want to talk about is the flow. You can see the design is about 2.36 based on current standards and operating depths of the facility. Uh, the flow is below the design. You can see we're at about 1.64 for 2008. Um, I think to date in 2009, we're in the 1.75 range. We've been increasing uh, through the years, but we're only at 70% of the design. The next one, BOD loading, that's uh, pounds per day, which takes into account both concentration and flow at 90%. So we're right um, bumping up against that design threshold. And then the other three parameters, uh, there wasn't any uh, design, inf uh, design values. However, they are higher than normal ranges that we'd see with normal domestic uh, wastewater. Uh, so wanted to point that out. What are those three? Can you explain those three parameters? Yep. Uh, total suspended solids, that's TSS, basically the solids uh, content. It's just a parameter commonly, commonly used. Uh, the next is the abbreviation, I guess, for ammonia. Uh, that is a parameter that is uh, limited in the discharge. And TKN is another, um, without getting into too much detail, it's a total Keldahl nitrogen. It's a combination of different forms of nitrogen in the wastewater. Basically, um, the ammonia, the nitrogen is nutrient loading as, you know, nutrient and fertilizer type things to the to receiving stream, so that's limited. And then sediment is the solids. Uh, after we looked at the existing conditions, we wanted to see how the facility was performing. Uh, we did some additional sampling at the facility uh, to really focus on the aeration ponds, which is the main uh, biological treatment method at the facility. Uh, the first table there shows the removal. Um, 
just to, you know, it's doing well. We looked at comparing that to standards and we're above uh, where standards show that similar aeration ponds would be. The one thing we don't have is uh, ammonia reduction. However, if you're high loaded in BOD, you usually don't see that. So that's actually to be expected and, and not cause for concern. Uh, the second table is overall front of the plant, plant to the back of the plant. And you can see we're in the 90% for BOD and TSS, you know, strength and sediment. And then uh, the effluent permit limits coming out the back of the plant have been met. Uh, next, uh, we looked at the per uh, performance analysis. You know, what does this mean, big picture type of thing? Uh, looked at the organic or, or loading constraints. As I mentioned before, we're getting close to uh, the design loading for strength. Uh, the ammonia removal uh, conditions in those front aeration cells aren't really conducive uh, to that process. If we need to do ammonia removal, it's probably going to have to be in a different area of the plant, um, which we will touch on in the last tech memo. Um, and the other thing we noticed is the aeration system. Um, there's no redundancy uh, in that aeration system right now. If there's a failure in the equipment, uh, we have no aeration which would lead to odors and, uh, and overloading at the facility. So that, that is a redundancy issue that we found. Uh, next, the hydraulics or how flow, flow gets through the plant. Overall, for design uh, storage, we're, we're fine. Uh, we started looking at individual pieces. And uh, the main limiting uh, factor is the, the top one on that list, the transfer piping between cell three and cell four. Um, we'd like to see six inches per day being able to go from cell three to cell four, and we're only at one inch. However, we are uh, in the middle of uh, a project to improve that with some stimulus dollars that the city received. Uh, the rest of the ones on the list, uh, currently under uh, flows that we've been seeing, do not uh, pose a major problem. However, as your flows increase, those are the next things that you're going to start to see a bottleneck. So after we looked at existing things, uh, what, how it's been doing, how it's been, been performing, what's coming in the front door, uh, we want to look at what's going to happen in the future. Um, and we looked at historic uh, values for flow and loading and then compared that to what you'd normally see for industry standards. And then we used population projections uh, based on growth thresholds uh, since uh, when looking at historic growth in Dickinson, uh, it's variable uh, as to different decades. Uh, we didn't tie it to exactly a year. We tied it to a population. So when the city reaches that population, then you'll know what, what step to do uh, based on population instead of what year. So the population threshold we chose was 1,870 uh, people. And you can see this is how that all lays out across the top. You have the various population thresholds. 20,500 all the way up to 26,180 um, based on you know a average I guess increases that we've seen throughout the years we think that'll be a 20 year or so life and it, of course it depends on growth and on all those uh, per, uh, different things that might happen uh, the conditions are basically different flow conditions different loading conditions and I'll just point out a few things. Uh, the facility design, you can see 2.85, which actually is a little, little bit lower uh, in practical uh, calculations on today's uh, standards. But the red box shows where we're getting outside of that, what the facility can handle. Um, the peaks, that's where we're outside of it, which is basically um, in the near future. And then again, keeps coming up the loading. We're basically uh, right at the loading uh, design. And the, the other thing uh, we always look at is Heart River. The facility discharges under a permit uh, to the Heart River. So anything that goes on in the Heart River as far as quality issues directly relates back to the wastewater plant. Um, this facility also irrigates effluent, but the main uh, method of discharge is to the river. And right now, it's basic secondary standards, which means it's, it's pretty common to other facilities. There's nothing really unique to Dickinson as far as standards. Uh, there is an ammonia limit, uh, but other things are basic secondary standards. 
And what we wanted to do is try to look ahead, at, you know, no one has a crystal ball, but let's see uh, what we may be able to figure out based on talking to some different entities uh, that regulate this stuff. Um, the Heart River is impaired, um, as listed as an impaired water. Uh, we talked to the Department of Health and, and they didn't specifically say that they see this, this or this limit in the future. But when we looked at the study on uh, what it's impaired for, uh, some things like nutrients and sediment came up. And uh, just looking at how the EPA um, will funnel those regulations down to the state, we see that that is a possibility of getting more stringent limits sometime in the future. And it would come from the EPA down through the state and they would uh, to the Dickinson Wastewater Treatment Plant. So though we can't say what year that may or may not happen, we think it'd be prudent to plan in this master plan for that in case uh, that would happen. And specifically, we looked at uh, phosphorus and the solids again, and um, then more stringent ammonia limits. And that's what we'll be looking at um, in Tech Memo 4. On the equipment evaluation, we'll briefly walk through the different steps. Uh, Pre-treatment building is the first phase. Receives all the wastewater, screens the wastewater, and removes the grit. From there, it flows into the inverted siphon, which is a set of three pipes underneath the Hart River that were installed in 1954. From the inverted siphon, we have the master lift station. Master lift station pumps from there over to the aeration basins. We have an east aeration basin and a west aeration basin. Uh, the east aeration basin, the equipment there is shown in the photo. That was installed in 1984. In the west aeration basin, that equipment has been removed and replaced with uh, solar powered circulators and pure oxygen injection equipment. There are several pump stations around the facility. The transfer pump station transports all the flow from cell number two to either cells three or four. So all the flow coming to the plant passes through that station. The other three stations listed are irrigation pump stations that are used intermittently. We've put the evaluation into a, in a, an equipment matrix just to give a brief overview of the condition of the facility. Pre-treatment building is in excellent condition. Well, let's say good to very good condition. That facility is 25 years old. Uh, the mechanical bar screen is in good condition. The grid chamber, uh, the screenings washer is newer. Um, overall, that, that pre-treatment facility is in very good shape. The inverted siphon are those three pipes going under the Hart River, about 55 years old. They're performing well. Uh, their condition is uncertain. As it's not something that's easy to inspect. Master lift station is in uh, good condition. The wet well, the pumps, and the structure are all in excellent shape. Deficiencies in this area, uh, we lack redundancy in the, the pumps in the master lift station. And we have a limited or restricted access down to the pump area. So we've marked the structure as being inadequate, but I don't want to give the impression that the structure isn't safe. The structure itself is in very good shape. It's just that we have a very small access down to the area where the pumps are serviced. And that's why the O&M and safety has been uh, marked as such. Aeration basins, uh, west aeration basin is in very good condition. East aerator, that unit has reached the end of its useful life. Uh, aeration unit lacks redundancy. As Carla mentioned, a failure there will result in odor problems. And we have some problems in both outlet control structures. Transfer pump station, very good shape. Again, we have an access issue. Uh, it's not severe, but it's just constrained access to that area. Irrigation pump stations are in pretty good shape and used intermittently. And the final item is the metering manholes. We meter flow from the master lift station 
and the discharge to uh, the Heart River. So the performance of those meters is uncertain. Overall, uh, the facility equipment-wise is in very good shape. This is a, a severe environment. Um, you, you can tell it's been well maintained over time. Our next step of the project will be technical memo number four. And this is an alternative analysis step. We'll look at the existing deficiencies. We'll take a look at future loading, uh, future restrictions to the Heart River. We'll look at deficiencies in the equipment end. We'll put these together and try to come up with a plan for the most efficient means for the city to address these issues long term. And that will be the capital improvement plan. We expect to be back to present the master plan mid-October, and we plan on completing this project the end of October. And that ends the presentation. Any questions? Oh, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, good presentation. Um, any comments or questions by commissioners? I know we don't have time tonight to get into a lot of this detail, but I'm really curious about the big one-year jump in your suspended solids and ammonia and whatnot. Have you speculated as to why? Um, are, are you going to address that maybe later in a later report? At, uh, as to which, which year? Well, from back. 2007 to 2008. And, and did you see the same thing in 2009? Do you have enough data in 2009? Is that trend continuing? Yeah, from 2007 to 2008, that's what I was trying to see what, you know, I, I guess I don't know. Usually when you see an increase in loading, you see everything kind of going hand in hand, BOD, TSS. And I, I'm not sure if something's, you know, happened in the city that would have, uh, uh, you know, led to that. I guess I don't know for sure, but that's something we can look into if it was um, isolated to one part of the year and that changed the overall average or if it's something, you know, in depth that we can look at that way to help get a handle on what might be going on. Do, do we know if this trend is continuing in 2009? I believe the loadings are continuing, as Skip said, but we can definitely uh, update that. You know, when we first started, it was March, and we had only data through March. But now that we're into August, that's something we can add as a column for 2009 and add that to our, our numbers for the final master plan. But I believe the flow, I know that number is 1.75 for 2009 compared to uh, what we had is 1.64 and I believe the loading is increasing however I don't know what the average is to date for 2009 off the top of my head that's something we can put in the master plan the final President Johnson I have a question yes um, kind of a um, side uh, light to your study was you made population projections and I noticed that they initiated at 20,000 plus. Uh, I, can't, I don't remember the exact number. Um, and you went up in uh, intervals of uh, 1,800, I believe, or, or thereabouts. Mm -hmm. um, because you started at 20,000, are you, are you saying that uh, our population currently by your projections based on the inflows is around 18,500? Yeah. Uh, and that's, that's a rough estimate. Mm -hmm. You know, all of our projections really are flow-based. So whether it's 18.5 or 19 or 18 or wherever you're at, um, when we, we used 18,700, and then we're using 10% increases, mm -hmm. so. And I think one, it, from what I, I understand is the most current uh, population estimate was somewhere in the 16,000s from something done out of NDSU. And, and what we did was based it more on, uh, when we're talking about water and wastewater type utilities, what we're seeing for flows to try and, and uh, I know Skip looked at uh, some 
you know, how many water meters and, and flows and connections and that kind of stuff to, to, so we didn't underestimate. If you underestimate, then you get a really large per capita flow base. And uh, when you project with large things, you're over designing as you get down the road. So that's, that's how it made sense flow and, and sewer wise to us. And, and we kind of worked with Skip on, on determining that. So I don't know if you have any that. Let, let me ask his question a little differently. Based upon the per capita flows here that you're working with, would it suggest to you that our population is between 18 and 19,000? That, that's the number we came up with, yes. Okay. And of course there's always industrial uh, contributions that skew that off a little bit, so we tried to take that into account as well as far as what their water usage is and take that out of the equation. But again, this is really based on a, you know, our first threshold was 20,000 some, I think, and, and if that happens in the year 2015 or 2019 or, tw you know, at least it's a number that you can keep track on and doing it that way versus a year. Um, and I know that was part of the scoping that we set up that seemed like a better fit for the city of Dickinson. Based, based upon what you know now when you were looking at those... Um uh, loadings uh, at, at what population level do we really start to strain the system well I, I think the the BOD uh, loading started to strain you know we're at 90 percent right now we're kind of straining that now yes uh, however flow gets you about 10 10 years down the line 10 more years and you know the the loading it's not to say you know when we hit that hundred percent everything's going to fall apart it's not that that's that's when you might start seeing more odors your performance of your process starts dropping off um, just things generally uh, don't do as well performance wise and anytime you're overloading things you do have the again potential for odors so um, now is you know looking at master planning you know this was a great time to do that because you know we're not under any real pressure pressure we got to do something tomorrow it will give you something that you can look at for budgeting and future uh, for both things yeah Let's go back and forth <laughs> other comments or questions i just have one question mr president on talking about odors it seems like it's more in the certain times of the year than others like the spring for example mm -hmm. Yes, um, the thing uh, that you have with your system is aeration in your primary ponds. That's where most of the high strength wastewater comes in. As long as you keep the aeration going, you uh, minimize odors that way. After the aerated ponds, you go to a conventional stabilization type pond. And even though the, the strength is lower, uh, it does still freeze in the winter and uh, there's no oxygen getting to that pond and once the ice comes off uh, you start to release some of those odors until you get enough oxygen in that pond uh, to you know basically make the odors go away so with a pond system you do have that turnover in the spring I know you have some uh, solar circulators there that do decrease that as well so I know that keeps it going um, and it would lessen those odors and lessen the duration and so you don't get the whole month long problem. You maybe get a few days of turnover till those contents start working again to the aerobic conditions. Does that answer? Yeah, thank you. Is there any way to totally eliminate odors with this system that we have? Aeration is really um, the thing. Uh, the, the thing with having ponds is you store uh, it for 180 days and then discharge which is great for the city um, you don't have to continuously discharge every day to the river and need to worry about limits you need more of a full-blown mechanical plant to do something like that yeah. um, so if you unless you go to a full-blown mechanical plant you have ponds and that's just the nature of it and the more you treat before you send it there with aeration the less your odors are going to be and definitely those circulators also decrease that uh, is, order. It, is it possible to aerate when the ponds are frozen yep it, well if you aerate it that it will s stop it from icing over completely so you'd have to keep that going and once you quit aerating 
then it would freeze and then you'd have to wait till it thawed to start your aeration again I guess depending on what kind of system you chose but if it's something like a surface aerator that's okay I would assume that that has to be something other than solar during the winter time um, yeah yeah you, I think so yeah I, I think I don't think you keep those uh, fully open the whole ponds open in the winter with those right skip President Johnson, with the uh, solar bees, even with the 24 hour motor kits, those are not designed for um, what I consider rough aeration where you end up with total mix and that, you know, you're keeping that water moving at a very rapid rate. So it would take some means of mechanical aeration, whether it's a blower and fine bubble diffusers or something like that to, to keep within that, that primary cell one. <coughs> um, I'd like to make one comment with the population data that they used is we did look at a lot of things with uh, estimating that data but uh, going back to basically 2000 or 10 years ago our pop our meter count number was 5240 as of about a week ago we we're at we we're at 6299 so we're almost at 6300 accounts so we've gained basically in 10 years almost a thousand meter counts you know so you know as far as those population numbers I would agree with uh, I'll take it that they're they're very close if not maybe on a little low side NDSU is a fine institution. I'm, I suspect that's the only thing they've ever made a mistake <laughs> at in their uh, entire uh, history is just the population count at Dickinson. Uh, wouldn't you agree with me, Commissioner Jackson? Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Mr. Rapp, I, I have a hunch that you're way ahead of us on this, but when I look at these numbers, it makes me suspicious about some point source issues with a one-year jump like this. Is this study going to look into point source issues or not, or are you looking at that? We, to get into, to answer your question and stuff too, make sure I can do this as politically correct as I can do it. Um, to get into individual point stores, we're not going to look at, at individual business stuff too, but to answer your question, I mean, as far as an overall process, we will have to look at that too, because I mean, that becomes part of the ability to treat the wastewater when it gets there. So yeah, I mean, as far as going back down to an individual business and things like that and looking at what we can do pre-treatment wise, uh, we're not going to do it, but from a holistic point, those will be looked at, yes. I don't know if I answered that question or not. Oh, I yeah, I think you did. But. <coughs> it seems to me we need to look at that. Yeah, yeah. And we have a, a fairly good idea of where that loading's coming from. For, the, for this to happen in one year. But anyway, enough yeah. for tonight. But um, Commissioner Jackson, with that though too, I mean, there is a spike in that one year and stuff too. And if you kind of somewhat average that out, and it's hard and stuff too because you don't have 24 months of actually rep uh, reputable data that yeah. to look at and stuff too. So you'll see a one year jump in there but um, you know we did a lot of testing for the study prior to that you know we we didn't do you know weekly testing we do you know probably monthly and stuff too so when you see maybe one month it's out of whack for some reason stuff too that skews that data mm -hmm. so but if you look at that trend line across you know that five-year period or whatever and stuff too I mean that trend is steadily increasing you know basically for the last 10 years okay thank you other thank you questions or comments okay thank you very thank much you. good report thank you. <coughs> well we'll continue on uh, to tab six and that's public works engineering mr. Sorn thank you president Johnson city commissioners um, under my report, I, I have three items, uh, code enforcement report, uh, project status update, and board of adjustments. Um, if there's questions regarding the code enforcement or the uh, board of adjustment meeting minutes, I'd certainly answer those. But tonight, I want to take some time and, and just visit about the, uh, the projects and, and where we're at with those um, today. Um, the first one I'm going to talk about is our, our seal coat project. Um, we did have a pre-construction meeting uh, last week regarding that project and um, the contractor is or has been in town um, starting the striping process for, the, for this year's seal coat and is anticipating being in town on Monday to actually start uh, um, the, uh, the sealing of the streets. Um, as part of that project or, or that pre-construction meeting we did have the, the discussions once again about last year's uh, 
project and the failure. And they certainly understand um, the failure. They didn't have necessarily a, a clear understanding as to why it, it did fail, but, but certainly are willing to do whatever um, we want them to do to, uh, to alleviate the concern um, and warranty that work. Um, they are pushing us, however, to, to look at alternatives over going back to the streets that, that the failures were on. Um, because of the, the amount of oil that was put on them last year and is still in place, they have concerns if they go on them again this year, uh, we might be getting on them too quick and creating other problems. Um, so uh, we're, we're evaluating the streets to make sure that uh, um, they are sealed and uh, coming up with some alleys that uh, uh, we've done some work on that need to be sealed and some other alternatives um, locations and, and they're willing to step up and take care of those for us as well to, to uh, compensate us for, for last year's issues. Um, so as part of that meeting, I was very pleased to, to, uh, to hear that from them and, and uh, uh, the fact that they're more than willing to step up and, and warranty the work that they did for us last year. Um, and they're certainly uh, uh, not wanting us to, you know, they want us to consider them in the future and, and they brought up those issues and not wanting us to think they're not a reputable contractor. Um, the next project uh, uh, that we've got going is, is our 2009 Urban Roads Project um, and 21st Street Stimulus Project. Um, the Urban Roads Project is, is 21st Street from State Avenue to 10th <coughs> Avenue East, um, 6th Avenue West from 21st Street North, and 10th Avenue West from 21st Street North. And then uh, the 21st Street from 10th Avenue West to 10th Avenue East is a stimulus project. Um, those are all uh, under contract with Northern Improvement. Um, they are expecting to be in town to start work um, on that project towards the end of this week, looking around August 20th, starting some of the con concrete work on that project um, and uh, planning to get that finished up this fall. Um, the other one uh, we had late last week, we had a pre-construction meeting on is our slurry seal project, which is Highway 22. Um, 8th Avenue Southwest um, to the Hart River, including the frontage roads, and uh, 4th Avenue East from uh, Villard to Museum Drive. Um, that project, uh, they're expecting to be in town uh, the week of September 8th, um, the day after Labor Day, to start that project. Uh, a couple other projects that we've had uh, underway is the, uh, the new water tower. Um, for the most part, that project is complete. The, the tank um, was filled. Um, there's some minor things that we're dealing with as far as some site grading, some painting, some things like that up there. But uh, for the most part, that project is, is complete. And our uh, uh, wastewater uh, relining project, um, they had completed that project last week and cleaning, uh, got most of the stuff cleaned up. Um, under their uh, evaluations, they did find a section about two feet that didn't cure out properly that they're going to have to come back and dig up. Um, and considering you know, 25,000 feet to only have issues with two feet, I think that project was a, a pretty good success for us. So. so with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions that uh, you may have. Thank you, Mr. Sorn. Is there any comments or questions at all? Okay. Well, we'll move then to tab seven, uh, public works. Uh, Mr. Rapp. Thank you, Mr. President. Commissioners, uh, the first item is the first reading of the cemetery ordinance. This ordinance has been reported on a number of times. It was presented to the commission um, at the last city commission meeting. There haven't been any changes at all other than to insert the word personnel in section 9.0707 and I did bring it up during that commission meeting but basically what this ordinance does is include the language to um, allow the city to reacquire cemetery lots that are um, unused for a period of 80 years and um, through that process if, if there's a cemetery plot that has not been used for that 80 year period and if somebody approached the city commission we can advertise um, to reacquire that lot and then 
after that process takes place, we can basically take that lot back and sell it. So that's the only really major change to this ordinance other than updating some of the language in it. And as I said, we've reported on this a number of times and from the prior meeting, there really hasn't been any substantial changes, so we're recommending approval of the first reading. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Rep. Um, you've uh, heard his recommendation. We'll ask if there's anyone from the public that wishes to comment regarding this proposed ordinance. If so, you could step to the podium, state your name, we'll hear your comments. There's no one from the public that wishes to comment. Would there be any other comments by other city staff? Not. Would there be a motion regarding this ordinance? I'd like to make a motion to approve the first reading of this ordinance. Okay, we have the motion. Is there a second? Second. We have the motion and the second. Any discussion? Hearing none, we'll vote. Mrs. Stuckart? Aye. Mr. Steiner? Aye. Mr. Jackson? Aye. Mr. Frenzel? Aye. Chair votes aye. Motion carries. Thank you, Mr. President. Next item is the third sale hydraulic improvements. Um, on June, July 30th, 2009, we opened bids for installation of a 30 inch line between the third and fourth cells of our wastewater treatment plant. Um, this money was reported a while back and we did receive uh, a low interest rate loan uh, from the North Coast Department of Health through the state revolving fund, loan fund for the construction of the project. Uh, when it was bid out, uh, the engineer's estimate with engineering and contingency, the project should have came in at about 826,000. Um, due to the 30 inch line and the, the directional boring that we plan to do out there between those two cells, um, there's only a few co companies across the country that do this type of specialized boring. Uh, the project came in at a million 76,000. Um, in meeting with Mr. Soren and Altic Engineering on the project, um, we looked at alternatives on how to reduce those costs and I think we've come up with a good plan to be able to bring that project back within um, acceptable limits and so tonight we're actually recommending that we reject the bids and we're going to redesign or, or make some modifications to those bids and rebid the project. Um, it's talking with the North Dakota Department of Health. They do have additional stimulus money available um, for communities and stuff too but um, like I said before, with some modifications to our current plans and specs, I think we can get this project back down to what our original estimate was. This this would be uh, the project or part of the project that um, Ms. Olson was referring to, the going from pond three to pond four, where we could increase our transfer from one inch to six inches. Correct. And okay. Yeah, and, and Mr. President, when we submitted this as stimulus, I mean, this has been a known um, limitation of our wastewater treatment plant process for a number of years um, because of the inability to transfer, you know, more than the one inch per day. We basically had to create or take three, third and fourth cells and make them basically one cell. We could not run series where we got the benefit of treating through the third cell, transferring the water to the fourth cell, and then discharging it, you know, because of this limitation on this line. and. Um, I think it'll be a good improvement on best case scenarios. I think we can actually transfer up to almost 10 inches per day with this 30 inch line. Okay. So your recommendation is that uh, the commission reject these bids and <coughs> and then you'll do some re-engineering? Correct and we'll rebid it. Okay. Any comments or questions by commissioners? Is there a motion regarding the recommendation? Move we reject the bids. Second. We have the motion, the second. Further discussion? Hearing none, we'll vote. Mr. Frenzel? Aye. Mr. Steiner? Aye. Mr. Jackson? Aye. Mrs. Stuckart? Aye. Chair votes aye. Motion carries. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. Rapp. Move to tap eight, City Administrator's Report. Mr. Kessel? Thank you, President Johnson. Commissioners, I have two items to report to you this evening. The uh, first is a fire uh, that occurred in our Baylor building uh, in the early mo morning hours of August 11th. Um, our fire department uh, did respond to an active fire and uh, put, that, put that out, um, but not until there was uh, s some significant damage to the building itself. Uh, the walls are all still standing. We're still accepting material. Uh, the operation is still moving on, um, although there was damage mostly to our electrical systems within the building. Uh, the cleaning crews are, are at the site uh, today cleaning the building on the interior. Um, the overhead crane was 
uh, damaged and is being repaired. Uh, the air handling units uh, were checked to make sure that the smoke damage uh, did not harm those uh, and they are okay. Uh, the ductwork is being cleaned uh, and the baler and conveyor system uh, are working. Um, we expected that or at <coughs> the best guess is that the fire started on the conveyor itself uh, and was either a combination of mixed rags uh, that maybe were used to clean up a floor, garage floor that had gas or turpentine or other materials, or maybe a uh, cigarette was thrown into a piece of furniture that was sitting on the baler and uh, smoldered for a great deal of time and then, and then caught fire. Um, the building itself, we're moving forward. Uh, we should see full repairs uh, within the next uh, month. Um, the, we may look at, when Mr. Cousy returns, uh, a look at our policies and procedures at that building to, to see if it's still in our best interest to, um, to pile the debris like we do at the end of the day uh, and allow that material to go unsupervised uh, for an evening until uh, staff returns in the morning. Um, so we'll, we'll review that and um, do whatever's in the best interest of the um, facility operations. The next update is on the museum building. This is also a, a building that we've had um, concerns with. Uh, there was water found in the ductwork uh, for the um, air conditioning and heating system. Uh, that water in the ductwork um, led us to be err on the side of caution and close the building down uh, uh, just in case there may be mold or other um, concerns. Uh, we have not found mold uh, in the building. Uh, there, uh, the cleaning, uh, a sump pump was installed and it has done an admirable job of keeping that ductwork clean of, of water. We have not turned on the um, heater yet, um, but we w until we clean out the air ducts themselves, once that occurs, then we'll, we'll uh, turn it on and, and uh, hopefully we won't have any further issues. Um, not sure if, if the sump itself uh, will take care of the issues long term. Uh, that is certainly our hope um, and our desire. Um, but we'll have to, have to see uh, how that goes. Um, at the risk of providing President uh, Johnson fodder, I just wanted to mention that since I've been here, there's been two blizzards that have... Uh, shut the community down. There's been uh, guests from Alabama that have taken pot shots at our, our police officials. Uh, there's been a tornado on the south side of our community. And uh, we've had H1N1 or swine flu concerns. Uh, so we got pestilence covered. I'm not sure what happens next. Uh, you forgot the uh, June 3rd snowstorm. <laughs> snowfall oh, I did. Also, yeah. Thank you for reminding me. I was absent uh, from the community that day or that weekend. So. So I, hopefully I've passed your probationary tests and you can call off the docs. <laughs> that would conclude my report unless there's any questions. Any questions or comments for the paranoid city administrator? <laughs> <laughs> Mr. President, uh, Mr. one question. Um, maybe you can answer this, Mr. Kessel, or, uh, or maybe skip, but uh, Mr. Rapp. Uh, I was approached today about the uh, Veterans Chapel up, up there. Uh, uh, an individual was concerned with maybe it needed some painting now, uh, a little more uh, look into it. Uh, he's talking about a, a uh, memorial on the side that was overcome by weeds and so on. And uh, uh, is our, is our uh, agreement to maintain the outside of these buildings along with the grounds? Is that correct? Commissioner Stenner, yes, the grounds and everything up in that area are our responsibility. Um, I had not heard that all. I did receive a call today up around a vegetable trap where there's some um, Canada thistle growing and stuff, too, and our weed control crews went up and sprayed that. But beyond that, I had had no conversation with anybody about yeah. Yeah, th This gentleman, he, he was just concerned the way it looked, and I just stopped in. I said, I have someone check into it, and maybe you can give us a recommendation of, of whether it needs painting or upkeep or what it needs yet. I will have somebody take a look at that. And, and that is part of the ongoing assessment up in that area yeah. stuff, too. The museum complex is looking at those buildings and, and the capital plans for painting and mm -hmm. um, all those facilities up there. Yeah. But uh, as long as Mr. Kessel's taken pot shots to the mayor, though, too, is uh, Miss Olson is a UND graduate. <laughs> she did find 
spite of her education. So. <laughs> <laughs> no, UND is a great school, and so. On. <laughs> so. Okay. Uh, anything else for the city administrator? Okay. Uh, tab nine accounts payable and payroll. Are there any accounts payable that uh, uh, that you'd like to discuss? Not. Would there be a motion to approve them? I'll make a motion to approve their account. We have the motion, the second. Uh, if there's no discussion, we'll vote. Uh, Mrs. Stuckart? Aye. Mr. Frenzel? Aye. Mr. Jackson? Aye. Mr. Steiner? Aye. Chair votes aye. Motion carries. Uh, are there any reports or comments by city commissioners? Not. Is there anyone from the public that uh, would like to speak to the uh, commission? If so, uh, may step to the podium, state your name, and we'll hear your comments. There's no one from the public <coughs> wishes to address the commission. Chair, to entertain a motion to adjourn. So, so moved. Second. We have the motion, the second. All in favor of adjourn.